Another question. Next question. More questions? Me. Right behind. Yes. Yeah. Question. I'm the tall guy. My question, do you think that the John Paul metaphor is used in the Occupy movement? I think it is. Does the John Paul metaphor, is it relevant in the Occupy movement? It can be. I mean, there are parts of it that I think are really close parallels, but there's some stuff that's further apart. I always say, like, you could see parallels with stuff happening today, like, all over history, you know? Like, there's stuff that looks like the Paris Commune, and there's stuff that looks like the big uh, general strikes of, uh, that sort of the Northwest is famous from. Like, there are parallels to all those conditions, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, like, the victims with John Paul. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll live with you. I'm not much of a European history guy. I'm not a biggest expert. From the blue, uh, a lab truck from Atlas Shrug. Oh, right on. I didn't remember that name. That's been a long time. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. And Ryan, the little mouthy one. Yeah. That part's okay. I like that one. She, she's really mouthy. She's been a guy. She died in 1956. Right on. Yeah, Ayn yeah. Rand. Yeah. I mean, Ayn Rand is kind of like, you couldn't have a more of a caricature of what economists believe than Ayn Rand. Like, all there is... She's sort of the, like the libertarian figurehead, right? I know there's always Ron Paul fans around. I'm not trying to dump all over libertarianism. It's got some cool aspects to it, so don't get me wrong. But Ayn Rand like, is the perfect picture of everything that's screwed up about how libertarians see the economy. Because their whole thing is, you know, like to say, we're against power. We favor the liberty or the freedom of the individual against the powerful institution. And that's a great message, if only they weren't totally retarded about what that means. Their whole thing is the government or the state right, is the powerful institution. It's the institution that oppresses people and tells us what to do and limits our freedom and keeps us down. And the state totally does that, but it leaves out concentrated economic power. And like I was saying, that's a weakness of all dominant economic theories to sort of have that blind spot there. So I was noticed that libertarians will always take the side of some large semi or fully monopolistic corporation uh, against the government just because the government is the institution that can oppress people. The idea is you got markets, there's always another company you can turn to. Often not really, actually, because of how markets operate. I mean, John Galtz, I mean, in everything Ayn Rand writes, it would be totally reasonable if there weren't any huge concentrations of economic power. You know, then it would be great, but we live in the opposite of that, so it's pretty dumb, I guess. Mike has a comment uh, or a question. I, I think all of the things that you talk about I more or less agree with. We don't have a disagreement. Speak but up a bit, Mike. So we can all of the things that you talk about are are reasonable things. We don't have a disagreement. But I think that when you look at economics, you look at the the actual study of purpose of what it's about. It's always about reducing the toil and the labor necessary to produce the stuff we want, okay? Unfortunately, economics runs into a little bit of a problem, which it's running into right now, in that we would be a lot better off with less efficiency, and we'd be a lot better off to, to break up these large corporations that have returned to scale. That's what makes them tick. That's what makes them efficient. We would be better off with a little less efficiency. Amen. Okay? And that's the thing that economics alone cannot do. Because economics is absolutely devoted to the minimization of labor, which is good. If we could find a way to spread this freedom, this free time that we get from minimization of labor among the people, instead of just focusing it on the 1%, that would be great. We don't do that. Right and that's the problem. Yeah. So, what if most people don't understand the reason for highly progressive income tax? It isn't to stick it to the rich. That's not what we're about. Okay? What it does is it makes it less lucrative to be huge. The stockholders lose their ass. Okay, because the huge organization ends up paying bukus of taxes where smaller organizations would pay less and the shareholders would be better off. That's the idea. But here again, 
You have to lay down the efficiency and start talking about the humanity. And economics doesn't seem to want to do that, which may be appropriate. I think but Tamara political economy should do that. Right on, yeah. We've lost so, a lot that way. I think Tamara has a comment she'd like to make. Hi, I'm Tamara Cook, and I know some of you, most of you. Can't hear you. Can you speak okay, up? Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I look at it from a different perspective. I used to be a lab technician. I came out to Washington State when I was 18 years old. I was a. Uh, um, I worked in environmental science and I worked in uh, hazardous radio, radioactive waste uh, uh, disposal. Um, I got a first-hand view of what Reed does and what, what's going on right now. My aunt spent all of my mother's family fortune on a nuclear power plant in Midland, Michigan because it was free energy. And it was free energy that they were going to, that, that was going to keep her in money for a long time. Um, they didn't take into consideration the burial cost. And that's what I was, that's what I was working with. I was working with, um, I was one of the first rad waste disposal technicians out there. I disposed of 40 years of um, hazardous radioactive waste. I was one of the first ones because I had my certifications from uh, when I worked at another nuclear plant in um, uh, Pennsylvania. So, so everything was brand new then. My problem was, as I, I was, I was kept down by the people that the bondholders. The bondholders were people like my aunt Dodo. She just wanted her returns, quick, easy returns. She wasn't caring about all the in, that. The waste generated from that nuclear power plant was going to take 10,000 years to decay when, where another human being could be next to it again. I think that there is a power above us that's taking care of us and watching out for us. We are all kind of stupid because we go into these things without thinking. Um, 10,000 years is a long time. Um, bond Bondholders are only caring about their return. They're not reinvesting within their community and within their people. Okay? We're not a communal people any any longer. And I see that as what the problem is. Our values are skewed. Um, what happened in Midland, Michigan is they built the power plant on a nuclear on a on a on a what did they build it on? They built it on a swamp. And so they had to mothball it. In eastern Washington, when I came out here, they were building five nuclear plants. And they hadn't cleaned up all the mess that they had developed from developing the atom bomb back in the 40s. So, so that's what I was a part of. I was out here to help clean up. I was one of those people that said, okay, let's get this done. And that's what I did. Um, I was the head of a lab that that had 140 people. I I got rid of waste that was 40 years old. Um, there was F-listed waste that you can't get. There's no safe way to get rid of it. There's no. There's ne never going to be any way that anybody can be near it. You can only store it and document where it's at. My biggest obstacle was money. I had the burden of responsibility to dispose of waste in a safe way. However, I had constraints from grandma and grandpa that was investing their money so that they could have a good retirement. So what I see is the problem is these people that are investing need to be aware of how they're affecting our communities and how they're affecting their neighbors and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and that they are the burden on our economy. They're the ones that are are making the little poor person run back and forth to Seattle. I mean, I, when, <laughs> I've worked so hard in my life, my God. I and I had lived in trailers. I lived in crappy places and all overinflated housing. And um, I always, always had a problem paying my bills. 
and I never could get ahead. And yet I worked at these horrible, dangerous jobs. And then you, then as the little, then as the little man, you're always trying to do everything right, raise your kids right, and <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of difficult when you've got media and everything else programmed into our environments differently. So what I'm thinking is, we have to start with number one. We need to start with our all of our values. All of our values need to come into play. We need to say, okay, this is what we want. You know, in Germany, I mean, I hate to bring up other countries, but the people said we want free television. <laughs> Give us a satellite. So the government put a satellite, and they get all they have to do is buy a satellite. <laughs> Cell phones, cell phone towers. I want to give him a chance to respond to some of this. Okay. This is really, this is a really interesting. Yeah, yeah right on. So, uh, fellow really know he got off. The uh, first guy who was talking, uh, he was talking about economies of scale and talking about efficiency and how we're all kind of slaves to efficiency. But the point of capitalism was to reduce the amount of labor that's required to produce things. And that's totally true. And I think, I've actually got to say, I'm pretty pro-efficiency. I just think that because it's in a market system, efficiency doesn't do what it's supposed to do, what it was meant to do. So the idea of efficiency is it takes less human labor to produce different goods and services for us to have and consume, right? Well, the th idea was if we're more productive, more efficient, we don't have to work as much to maintain a standard of living. And the idea originally was this new steam engine is going to allow us to only have to work half as much to have all the things we need for life. But it's a market system, so if the workforce is twice as productive, that doesn't mean they only have to work half as much to live. It means you lay off half the workforce, and now you don't. And now most of the people don't have the basic things that they need to survive. That's because of how the market system treats efficiency. Okay? I'm all a pro efficiency as long as we're not getting efficiency by destroying the environment, which about half the time is how it's happening. Right. But efficiency should be extremely valuable to us because it could give us basic lives where you don't have to work continuously. And the whole idea of retirement is you deserve some time in your life where you're not constantly working under some corporate hierarchical authority or public hierarchy. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I would just say because of the market context, that productivity is a curse for the workforce half the time. When we go through a new expansion of productivity, we're using more robotics or more streamlined production process, whatever it is, to make us more productive, it's the workforce's misfortune. And it's bad for us because it means the workforce is going to take it in the neck. And that's the opposite of what should be happening. I mean, that's bananas that we should be hoping the workforce will become more productive. Now, of course, economists will tell you that, well, unemployment's not a big deal. If you just leave the market system alone, it generates more jobs, so losing your job isn't such a big deal. And it's actually positive because it frees up labor for other parts of the economy. Only problem is, since we deregulated finance, investments actually decrease as a component of the economy, especially if you don't count speculative investments like flipping real estate. So I'm actually in favor of efficiency, and I should maybe say I got a chapter in the book that's specifically about economies of scale and why corporations want to get so big, because it makes them far more profitable when they attain scale, is sort of the short version of it. And it means that they're more institutionally efficient, which could free us from having to do a lot of drudgery and work, Instead, it just means we get less we get less employment, is how it tends to shake out reality. Okay, and then, of course, the other issue was uh, talking about how investors or bondholders uh, are sort of running the show and causing a huge amount of problems for people and the environment, obviously, and not playing a role in it. Well, of course, my colleagues are going to come back. You know, my, you know, economists are very clever. They have answers for everything that we say. They're just really shitty answers. But you want to know them, because then you can see what's wrong with them, rather than walking away feeling like you lost the argument or something like that, or for other people to think that. So you got to realize, yeah, these guys, the investors will say, well, we created this job. If it wasn't for us, you would never have the chance to work. Okay. It's only because they monopolize resources. And that's the reason why they're able to claim that. But it's absolutely true. They are the ones who sort of pull the strings in our economic system, obviously. But also, yeah, they're the ones who are lever sort of leveling costs on future generations. And you know, the private nuclear power industries may be the best example of that, because those are costs that, gener that people are going to be bearing, like you said, in 10,000 years, for example. That's some radionuclides only take that long to decay, some take way longer. What's worth pointing out, 10,000 years, that's about how old civilization is. Human civilization. Neighborhood of 10,000 years, not human existence, just the settled agriculture and civilization. So that means that's like what they were doing right at the beginning of planting crops, 
we would still be dealing with the end of the cost that they had created. We're creating waste that'll last that long, 10,000 years. It's very true. It's mainly economics that lets people stay in denial about that. I gotta say, it's because people have a nice set of ideas that we're creating jobs, T technology will solve our problems, like we've created this deadly ass plutonium that no one can touch for 10,000 years. People have a cartoonishly childish picture of how these problems are all gonna get fixed. It's mostly my people that have propagated that. I'm just, I'm just saying that we have sort of a special role in making people believe all these crazy ideas, I guess. I would say that the basic fundamental idea of economics from the beginning is this. You have natural resources, you have a population of people, and then you have needs that these people have. I'm getting to, getting to that. Then you have needs that these people have. The basic problem of economics is how do you get those natural resources, process them, and distribute them to people to satisfy those needs? All economics systems, since we started farming the land, have been based on that. Before then, he, you mentioned 10,000 years ago is when human history began, that's true, but for 130,000 years before then, we were in the old Stone Age. That meant that we spent all of our time just gathering up food, gathering up what we needed. 10,000 years ago, we farmed the land and we had enough resources for people to live without working. The first ruling classes. And we organized societies around that, justifying why this particular, well, he can read. He knows when the sun is going to set. He knows when the seasons are gonna change. So he's the expert, he's the ruler. And it used to be people just exchange things. That's what value was, they just exchange things. You know, I make a loaf of bread, I give it to you, you give me a, a pair of shoes. After a while, that became more and more complicated. We became more and more organized, so people began figuring out other ways of exchanging things. Today, we have what's known as commodity exchange. This is the basic way we do things. A commodity is something that has a use value, like this wonderful stuff that I recommend, this sourdough bread that Aubrey made. It's just great. That has a use value. He didn't make it to sell. It's not on the market. You can't buy it. Well, it's gone. I paid my share of it. The market cleared. Yeah, the, it, it cleared. That had use value. If this camera, I bought this camera, it had exchange value. I gave a couple of hundred bucks to this lady who gave me the camera. So it is a commodity. Most production in our society is commodity production. It is produced to sell. And the people who own and control those means of production and distribution have interests that are totally different than yours. That's the key to a lot of our problems. Why is it that we have this environmental disaster that you described with the, with the plutonium? It's because it was in their financial interest to have that. It wasn't in your financial interest. It's not in his financial interest. It's in their financial interest. We have a different class interest than, than the people who own and control society, and they are a very small group of people. That is, I think, my way of thinking, one of the basic fundamental problems with the capitalist system. It was very progressive when it started. It brought us a lot of ideas. It, did you know that it brought us the idea of universal time? It used to be that noon here in Tacoma might be different than noon in Squim. They had to they had to have some sort of time scheme so that they could run the trains. They ran the trains so they could distribute goods and services. We got the idea of the nation state. We got a lot of our basic ideas of freedom of speech, things like that. All this came out from the early days of the capitalist, what they call the bourgeois democratic revolution. Now, it's become a contradiction to it because he who has the gold makes the rules and it is not in the interest of the people who own the gold to let you make the rules. You don't get to vote on whether the air you breathe is clean. You don't get to vote on whether the environment is polluted with plutonium. 
You don't have. You don't. You don't have control over that. Yes, I do. The EPA. But the EPA. That's protected. Yes, the EPA. Corporations are writing those rules now. No, there's plenty of environmental groups that stand up and fight for our rights. That's right. You're right. They do stand up and fight for our rights, and they have some effect. No, they have a lot of effect. That's what my job was. But you know what? They would have. They would have no effect. They would have no effect if they did not stare down and organize against the people. That's the key. Oh. See, whatever effect they have, they have because of that. That's the key. That's what we have to understand. We have to understand that if we do things like involve ourselves in the environmental movement, do things like involve ourselves in the Occupy movement, do things like involve ourselves in and uh, move to amend these movements, we begin to train ourselves that when we stand up together against the interests of the <coughs> capitalist class, we can have an effect. Yeah. Excuse me, Chris. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's kind of the difference between an effect and control. Like we don't directly control whether the EPA gets enforced, but we can be in the streets and demand it, and that has something. This person's been trying forever. So. Well, I, I came into this a little late. I, are you an economics professor? Is that what you are? Yeah. Uh, What's going on now in um, in teaching? Are, are, is Milton Friedman going away? And, <laughs> and no. uh, is it no. is I wish. Um, Greenspan going away? And everybody, all these guys? No, it, they're exactly as standard as ever. Uh, that's one thing we were saying before. Yeah. Okay. The hard sciences, like I came up in the hard sciences originally, and when we screw up horribly, like in the hard sciences, I mean those people are only human too, but they'll usually cop to their horrible errors, you know. And sometimes they can't ignore them, right? So if it's astronomy and we have an eclipse when there's not supposed to be one, astronomers will change their shit up, right? They'll change their analysis or get fired. That's the expectation. Economics, we have a giant disaster every 10 years after recommending deregulation, tax cuts, these are gonna create all these positive things, the opposite happens. It's a very standard curriculum. Like I can tell you to the extent that I teach independent stuff, I'm kind of teaching around a core theoretical curriculum that hasn't changed in it hasn't changed much in many, many decades, like 50 well, years. I, We're in denial. It's I institutional have, denial. I have a... Well, is it? I'm, I mean, it, maybe it's institutional denial, but it's really good for the business. It's really good for corporations and business to never have this really stop. So, my real question is, I've been hearing that right. we're going to be doing all right now for about five years, and we're going to have another big disaster economically. Wait, we're doing all right? And it's built in. They want it. Oh, we can't probably stop it. What we need to do is prepare for it. Yeah, well, I gotta say, just up right up top, economists have a really god-awful record at predicting things. Yeah, well, really, really bad. At least, I'm, at least I'm willing to admit it. Most of my colleagues would say it's gonna happen. Like, it hasn't really been great for five years. It's only been great in the sense we haven't had, like, more total disaster. Like they did forestall well, more but collapse. We've, we've still got a lot of we've still got a lot of loss from this one that is not being talked about. I mean, a lot of loss. A lot, well, uh, tens tens of uh, trillions of dollars out there. I don't know what what did I hear? Sixty? There's still sixty five trillion dollars or a hundred and something that's not, really not accounted for in this loss. That's really oh, out there. That's going to. I mean, it's lost. Well, there's. And it hasn't been. It hasn't been. It's not in the mainstream. We're not talking about this. It's still there, and nobody's dealing with it. And so it, it will go along for five years, and then we're going to get we're going to catch up with the fact that it's really out there. Yeah. Well, you got to be a little specific, you know. Like the amount there's a huge amount of wealth that's owned by what we call the one percent, the wealthiest parts of our society, and they hold it in different places. You know, a lot of it's offshore and sort of held in places where they don't have to disclose what their wealth is. You know. So there's that, and that's where you get up into the tens of trillions of dollars in assets. I don't know about 60 trillion, that no, could I'm be. I'm talking about the loss from the market. I'm talking about the, I'm talking about the actual loss oh my from, God, what, the loss of wealth loss from of the market. Well. Okay, yeah, totally. Yeah. That's something we mentioned before, yeah, that, okay. that crisis was trillions and trillions of dollars that made it many, many times as, as expensive as the worst natural disaster that's ever happened. But I mean, it's even worse than those figures. Uh, you know, that's possible. It, it kind of depends on exactly how broad you want to be. Like, I could say that that crisis only cost $4 trillion because that was the loss of 
housing value and the bailouts. But of course, you want to consider that it kicked off a gigantic recession that we're still kind of struggling to get over, even though technically the economy is well, it's like things they have not yet marked down. Okay, right on. Yeah, okay, well, I mean, there... There's, there's, like, there's stuff out there that they're just... Right on. There's a, okay. I got a chapter on that, too. The banks are kind of hiding their yeah. bad positions. Yeah. yeah. That's true. And because of their strong market position, they can even kind of get away with it. Their stocks are hammered because of it, but they can still like get so by. So, anybody talking about that in your profession? Uh, a couple seen people. Anything in the main, really? Main press on. Yeah, really. If you want to get information like that, which is some of the core, yeah. most important information, this is something I talk about too. You really got two ways you can go. You can look at what radicals are saying, you know, people who are outside the economics mainstream, I guess, like me, I suppose. Or you can look at what the business press is saying. Those are the two places where you're going to see it. So if you look at the New York Times, but not just like the front page, like the business section or the Wall Street Journal, and the editorial page is a right-wing Fox News ranting ground, so you can ignore that. But uh, the rest of it, like that's a lot more candid than the regular mainstream press is. Because you know, it's for investors and for executives, that's its audience, so it has to be closer to reality so people can read it and learn how to make money. You know what I mean? So I'd say if you want a candid analysis of that what sort are they of stuff. Calling it? Do they have a name for it? Oh, well, sure, yeah, there's different ways that people call it, you know, a, Everyone's favorite term is uh, zombie banks because these banks are technically insolvent because they have so many bad assets that are actually lo they've lost money on, but they don't put them back on the market so they don't have to acknowledge the debt. And they got a million little accounting maneuvers you know you can use to hide that. Oh uh, yeah, it's discussed. I mean, half of what I know about it comes from reading the Wall Street Journal, where it's on the front page, but no one's aware of it because who reads the Wall Street Journal? That's Investors and executives. That's who. That's a good point. It's a, it's actually a very good newspaper, even though. It's very reactionary in its political views. Yeah, there's no point. What in I would that. say about about Hang uh, out, yeah. understanding yeah. about money is that money is not wealth. Money is a piece of paper or a digit on a computer. Wealth is what we produce with our labor power. Wealth are the goods and services. It's the clothes you wear. It's the food you eat. It's the housing you live in. It's the artwork you buy. It's the entertainment you buy. That's what wealth is. When this crisis occurred, the wealth didn't go anywhere. It's just that the money went somewhere, and nobody's seeing where the money went, but the, bank, the banksters are all smiling very large smiles because the wealth became concentrated in the fewer and more mysterious hands in the sense of the money became more and more concentrated. Wealth is produced by the cooperative labor of millions of people throughout the world. I mentioned this yesterday. If you take a look at that camera that he is holding, that was made by tens of thousands of people, probably some of them working in slave labor conditions. But it was created by a lot of people cooperatively. And yet the control of that wealth and who gets it and how it gets distributed and who profits from it is in the hands of a small group of people. Here's how money wealth is created. It is created by a capitalist buying your labor power, your ability to work. So the people who created that camera, they sold their labor power to the employer. And that labor power, it's not the same thing as labor incidentally, it just seems like it because they get paid after they... That labor power is a commodity also because it can be replaced. It's something of value and the cost of that labor power is whatever it costs to educate the worker to do the job, to feed and house that worker and the family and reproduce the worker. That is the cost of labor power. And what the capitalist does is they create that camera for say like 25 bucks and they sell it for 50 bucks to a supplier and they make a $25 margin over that. They use part of that to, to pay for the cost of their equipment and the overhead and all of that. And what's left over is profit. And that profit becomes, is what, you know, the money is that becomes more and more concentrated in the fewer and fewer hands. But it is actually a mythical, Thing in a computer okay, somewhere that determines what you do. Now, if he picks up that camera and walks out of the store without paying the money for it, yes. 
the, you know, the security guy's going to come up and he's going to say, excuse me, you forgot to pay for that camera. And if he says, I don't intend on paying for the camera, and he starts to walk out, the security guard is going to have him arrested. And if he's got two buddies with machine guns, they'll call out the whole damn SWAT team, and eventually they'll even call out the whole army. So the property relations that exist, which is a social relation, ultimately is enforced through violence. That is how the wealth gets concentrated into fewer and fewer hands. Ultimately, it rests upon violence, and it's a myth, and it's a ripoff of our labor power. That's what Marx meant by exploitation. That was a great explanation, except for the part where you said they sell it to the retailer for 50 bucks. Well, they, they probably sold it to a reseller for 50 bucks who sold it to a warehouse where it sat. You know, it came up more expensive than that. Oh. By the time you buy it, you paid, you know, 300 bucks for it or something, which is about what I paid for mine, a similar camera. Trust me, this yeah. camera started started uh, a lot more expensive and then got more. Well, <laughs> But the point I'm trying to make. I is, no, yeah. I got your point. Yeah. I was just laughing because yeah. like. And it was an, it was an analogy. <laughs> well, I'm laughing because okay. we cleared the room. Yeah. <laughs> well, we usually do. No, people, people need to help take things down now. Yeah. Yeah, right. Everybody's doing it. Well done, everybody. Well, thanks for coming, everybody.